current panel led by Tommaso from the International Monetary Fund will now discuss the proliferation of stablecoins together with Daniel Dixon from Stella as well as Jeremy of Circle. Uh, everybody, please enjoy. Good morning. I'm Tommaso Mancin from the IMF and I'm delighted to be here on this panel on stablecoins with uh, Jeremy Allaire and uh, Danelle Dixon. Danelle is the CEO of Stellar Development Foundation and Jeremy the CEO of Circle. And uh, today we're going to be discussing stablecoins, central bank digital currencies, and focusing on issues of interoperability, in, including in cross-border payments. So before we begin, perhaps uh, for the benefit of the audience, uh, we could ask, I could ask Danelle and Jeremy, uh, to give us a very brief uh, overview of the main mission and products of each of your companies. Danelle first. Sure, thanks so much. This is great to be here. The Stellar Development Foundation's mission is creating equitable access to the global financial system. And our, our uh, focus is doing that through the use of this open decentralized network, which is called the Stellar Network. Uh, and we believe that by connecting the network to the existing banking infrastructure, we can actually touch those that are unbanked and underbanked all over the world. Thank you. And Jeremy? Sure. Um, Circle's mission is to raise global economic prosperity through programmable internet commerce. And um, we very specifically are focused on how can we take the benefits of uh, you know, public blockchain infrastructure, digital currencies, and the programmability of money that comes with that to really transform how the world economy functions and in doing so, raise prosperity for for everyone around the world. That's that's the high level focus. And then, you know, specifically Circle um, operates a set of, um, you know, financial platforms and services that provide payments infrastructure built around stable coins. Uh, we were the, one of the uh, leading issuers of, of one of the fastest growing stable coins in the world, US dollar coin, and um, offer services to businesses that want to build on top of that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, we'll dive right in and uh, we'll start uh, with the uh, 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 question of central bank digital currencies. And as you know, there's an increasing number of central banks around the world considering uh, the option of introducing a central bank digital currency, a digital currency that they would issue directly uh, to the public for retail use. And the uh, central banks are thinking about doing this for a variety of reasons. Some for to economize on cash management costs, uh, some for financial inclusion purposes, some for resilience because they see the payment system being increasingly in the hands of large private companies, and some simply to compete against the big tech firms that are introducing new means of payment um, and in order to remain relevant. So it's actually very interesting for us at the IMF who go around and speak to countries around the world to see the diversity of uh, reasons that central bank give to be interested in central bank digital currency. And so this may become a reality relatively soon. And my question to you, um, and Jeremy and Danelle, is if central banks were to issue a central, full-fledged central bank digital currency to the public, would you still be able to remain in business? Uh, would the central bank digital currency be a formidable competitor or not to your business model? I'm happy to take that uh, just just to start. Um, you know, I, I think the the kind of mission and vision and 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 really, frankly, the the product strategy that we have as a company is really just it's predicated on the idea that. Um, digital currencies that are based on the leading reserve currencies of the world, that those exist and that those can be used on the open internet, on open networks, in, 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 in interoperable ways, and that the, the benefits of things like smart contracts and the programmability of this are, are available. Because if those things exist, we think that um, the world of, uh, of payments is transformed, but more importantly, the way in which economic actors can uh, can enter into relationships with each other, whether it's people or businesses or, 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 or both, can really be transformed. So from our perspective, we're, we're sort of long on 
digital currencies that work on the public internet that are based on on uh, on you know leading sovereign currencies. We're we're very long on that idea, and um, you know right now that's really happening through private sector innovation um, in in many cases. And as you note, there is there are some public sector um, projects as well. But in in my opinion, if you know just say the Federal Reserve said, you know what. This is something that we want to be sort of directly involved in, um, you know, as a financial institution that's providing platform services to businesses to take advantage of this innovation. We would love to work with the Federal Reserve uh, for to, to utilize their digital currency as well. So, um, from 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 a business model perspective, a product perspective, and even a mission vision uh, perspective, um, these are not in conflict with each other necessarily. That's there's a whole separate discussion around whether that's the right thing to do or what's the role of public sector versus private sector, which I know we're going to talk about. Yeah. And yeah, from the Stellar absolutely. Development Foundation, from our perspective at the Stellar Development Foundation, like our network is set up perfectly for CBDCs to be issued on Stellar. And we actually, I mean, there's so many different ways to be able to get this out to the, to the public, but we would love to see this. This is a way that governments can uh, get in contact with those users out there that currently don't have a bank just down the street to be able to get to them, but could use a mobile device to be able to uh, connect up with the banking infrastructure, for example. So from our standpoint, CBDCs actually enhance uh, not just our network, but just the, the financial system as it exists today. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So you both actually have the view that uh, CBDC would be complementary. Uh, to your business model. Um, and in fact, what is interesting is that central banks themselves are looking to the private sector as a potential partner, uh, as a potential complement to uh, CBDC. And uh, so this idea of a public-private partnership is really starting to permeate uh, the circles of central bankers. Um, in fact, with Tobias Sadrian, who is the director uh, of the Monetary Capital Markets Department at the IMF, and I, uh, we wrote a paper last summer uh, on public-private partnerships in CBDC. We call this synthetic CBDC. And our view was essentially that the um, private sector could issue tokens, could settle payments, um, but the central bank would regulate uh, this issuance, would ensure that issuance would be fully backed with central bank reserves, uh, and then would supervise, of course, these entities. So the private sector has a comparative advantage in uh, dealing with customers and in innovating. So we give that to them. And the public sector has a comparative advantage in regulating and providing trust. And so the public sector retains that function. So that's one way to do a public-private partnership, synthetic CBDC. But there's another way. And the other way is for the public sector to issue tokens and settle payments and for the private sector to distribute tokens. And that's very much uh, an application to the digital world of how we deal with cash today. So cash is issued by the central banks, but they're distributed by commercial banks. So in that arrangement, the, public, the private sector would be in charge with interfacing with clients, but not with innovating uh, and providing a technology. So those are two different models, and central banks around the world are wrestling with which of these two models is the right way to go. And I'd like to ask you for your opinion. Where do you stand in this debate? What, what do you think makes most sense to stimulate innovation, competition, um, the continuous evolution of, of technology? Um, and what would maximize uh, consumer welfare in your view uh, of these two models? I'm happy to so, so, take a crack. At, uh, oh, go ahead, Dana. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'll just jump in and say, from my standpoint, no. I think yeah. so long as so long as we actually had a structure where we have standards that are issued. Um, so in either model, I think you would need that structure. So from my standpoint, interoperability is the most important piece. Um, I think that innovation is an important piece that we. Uh, I don't. I don't believe that we've lost it on the content side of the web, but I do think that it became more challenging on the content side of the web to innovate once we had a few entities that sort of controlled that content. And I would love to get us to a place um, on the on the payments in payments infrastructure and using digital payment rails, where we actually continually have that innovation. And I think standards are the way to do that. So I think in either model, you need to have that standardization that's sort of set in a way that allows interoperability. So I'm open to either model. I do think innovation is an important piece of it. And so 
I, I have a slight preference for the first model, which is to allow that innovate the issuance and the innovation to occur um, at the at the private level. Uh, if we can continue to keep those standards to be utilized and um, and and promulgated, but then also like improved upon over time, I have a slight preference for the first model. But I think either could work as long as the central bank is not the entity that's engaging with the public, um, because I don't think the central bank has that infrastructure today. Um, if I'm just taking, for example, the U.S. Central Bank and many others that we've talked to, they don't have that infrastructure to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the with the actual end user, which would be the um, the consumer. I think that either model could work. Yeah, I I would echo um, echo those thoughts, and I, I think um, you know th there is this sort of these these different worlds colliding, right? You have the world of the internet, which has been built in a particular way, and and there's there's you know some incredibly positive aspects to the this public open networks permissionless networks decentralized infrastructure you know open technical protocols open source software like that's the dna of the internet and it's it, it allows billions of people to interact and do amazing things there's private sector concentration of power on that as well but fundamentally the infrastructure is the is this open permissionless standards infrastructure that's not controlled by any government it's not controlled by any private sector actor it is truly a public good that world um, colliding with the historical financial system which has been much more tightly controlled uh, which has often been uh, operated on standards that are set uh, either by large private sector actors or by governments themselves typically kind of stovepiped by nation state or region and those worlds are colliding now and um, I think it's a great thing. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, my, my high level view here is that, um, you know, echoing again what Danelle is saying is um, we, we really need to let what the internet does well continue to do that. And for the first time, we're, we're actually seeing a very bottoms up creation of a new infrastructure layer for the economy. And it's bottom up in terms of the what I think of as like the operating system layer that's being created, which is blockchains mm -hmm. themselves. Uh, it's bottom up in terms of the the uh, the the protocols that are being created, or the app or protocol layers that are being created created on top of that, i.e., you know, stable coins and fiat tokens. And we're starting to see standards organizations emerge, associations, consortiums that are you know focused on trying to bridge the world of regulatory requirements, compliance requirements, you know, things like reserve requirements, these sort of what the FSB is calling global stablecoin arrangements. Um, we're starting to see some of those emerge, which um, really can be both standards bodies and, uh, and but, but facilitate the kind of technological development that the internet has, has made so amazing and has made projects mm -hmm. like, you know, Stellar possible, just an open source project. And so many of these are open source public intellectual property things and sort of the top down, like we're a big country, we should get a big R and D project and go build something and then put a stamp on it and say, this is what we're doing. I don't think that works in this world. I think that governments around the world are going to have to yield to um, the open internet and, and figure out how to participate in that. And they haven't had to do that in the financial system. They've had to do it in almost every other sector, uh, the transportation mm. system, the communication systems, like, you know, the International Telecommunications Union and the FCC would have been the bodies you would have thought about who are controlling, you know, how we communicate or, or how information is broadcast. They have nothing to do with that now. You know, we're having this peer-to-peer -peer video conversation. There's no government regulator involved in that. It's just software and open protocols on the internet. So that's coming to the financial system. And so I think the, the really key role for central banks is to figure out, you know, of course they need to play a central role in the actual mon monetary supply, uh, the setting of, you know, the, the price of money, as it were, the issuance of that, the lender of last resort, the supervisory standards for, for intermediaries. Um, but do they really need to get involved in building uh, standards and infrastructure and, um, and so forth? And I just, I don't believe that they do. I think there are some exceptions to that um, around the world, clearly. Um, but my, my, my broad view is that this is a place where so much can can flourish uh, through these multi-stakeholder 
uh, associations and consortiums where stakeholders include central banks. It's not to say that central banks aren't major so, stakeholders. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's talk about this interoperability issue a little more because you, you've both spoken about. I mean, you you both seem to think that innovation is obviously important and that. Uh, it should be left uh, to the private sector as much as possible. Now, of course, central banks would remain involved. And in this synthetic CBDC concept that we just discussed, the central bank would license a private sector company uh, to participate, to issue uh, tokens. And the license would ensure that there's you know, operational resilience, governance standards, et cetera, et cetera. But very importantly, the design, the fundamental design of these payment tokens would also be determined by the central bank. And specifically in this case, the design would call for one-to-one -one backing with central bank reserves. Uh, so that's all fine. But then there's a, I'm, you know, when I think about this, I see a world of multiple private sector players, each issuing their token, following the central bank license and adhering to all the regulation, but a multitude of issuers, each with their own technology, so it's great for innovation, but what about the interoperability? I want to be able to pay somebody who holds a different token, issued on a different network, on a different blockchain. Um, and we know that companies, private companies, are going to resist this interoperability. They're going to try to lock in customers. They're going to want to grow their networks. Um, and clearly, from a policymaker standpoint, this is a problem. Then we're creating monopolies. And... So how do we ensure interoperability between digital tokens issued on different networks? Is there a way to incentivize the private sector to issue, to, re to respect and to build in interoperability? And then we can speak a little bit more about setting standards later. But your first view on how to solve this problem of interoperability and potentially creating incentives for interoperability. Danelle, well, do you want to go first? Sure. I think it's really interesting. One of the things that I don't think we've done well on uh, with the web as it exists, and, and frankly, uh, if you think about open standards, is that we have this infrastructure that allows all this communication and all this opportunity all around the world. And that has remained open. And that has remained in a space where everyone can contribute to it. And also folks are easy. It's easy to connect up to it. The layer on top of it is the layer that's been really uh, created those walled gardens around it so that you don't actually have the ability to um, have federated federated IDs and federated communication between them. Although if you think about it, email has been one that actually has been able to create that opportunity where you actually can go from one network to another. So the, the, the private sector has actually determined a way to make it so that it's still useful for them to maintain this uh, email infrastructure, even though it's going between and, and you're, you're having these federated addresses all over. I think if we actually were to think about the issues that you, you can still actually delight your customers and um, try to maintain your customers within your sort of space in this open infrastructure, if you are constantly in competition with someone else out there who is doing trying to do the same thing, but you're, you're not allowed to create a wall that's so that's so big and so deep that you actually don't have a way from a federated standpoint to get in that wall. I think we can do that. And I think that it's something that I think should be incumbent uh, when you're dealing with money, particularly when you're dealing with money, that you shouldn't actually select a winner uh, because that winner will then have no need or desire to be able to to have to innovate and to change. And frankly, that's sort of where we are today. If you think about the existing financial infrastructure, it hasn't changed in years and years and years. And it's because we've had these isolated walls around each country, each geography, however you want to define it, and they haven't been required to actually change and therefore interoperability hasn't been achieved. So I think once we achieve it, we have to make sure and put standards around it to enforce that and to enforce that interoperability so there isn't one player that wins. Yeah, I, I totally, totally agree. Um, you know, we, we've said for a long time, you know, the, the opportunity with public blockchains is is to create kind of create an HTTP of money, which, you know, is the idea that there's, you know, there are standard protocols that everyone can agree on. And that there are there are bodies that come together to improve that and contribute to it with lots of companies that compete with each other to do that. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, Danelle knows this incredibly well from the, the work at Mozilla and web standards Mozilla. and yeah, absolutely. And, but web standards are, are, are such an interesting example of that where, you know, Google 
and Apple and Microsoft and Mozilla and all these other groups basically saying, hey, we need a standard for how audio and video communications happens on the web. And we don't want everybody doing their own thing. So, you know, web, you know, RTC, a little bit of a tangent here, but that's a standard that every browser in the world implements. And that means that you can connect into these video calls seamlessly, no matter what people are using. And that's what we, that's what we need here. Um, And and I think um, we're, we're quite close to that actually. And, And I think, um, you know, having standards for, you know, the, the settlement of, of fiat tokens, uh, the issue in, issuance and settlement of fiat tokens is something that, you know, we're personally working a lot on uh, as a firm and, and in other and in, in, in contributing that IP to, to other organizations. But I think it is something that we're we're getting, you know, much, much closer to um, and realizing those those ideas. And I, I would also just remind the 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 you know, the, the folks who are watching this, that, you know, the, the first generation, you know, the, 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 the first two generations of electronic money are, are associations of, sta- you know, standards uh, associations for interoperability. SWIFT is a member-based association of, of commercial banking institutions. It's multi-stakeholder. It defines a set of electronic messaging standards. That's how money moved in the global financial system still does in many ways. And the second generation of electronic money, which we all take for granted is the IOU reconciliation engine that we call card networks, which is essentially a way to represent the IOUs between counterparties that are regulated financial institutions. And it's a set of interoperability standards so that every issuer uh, can be interoperable with every acquirer. And there are multiple schemes like that, and, and those exist at massive scale. And I think we're now, with things like stable coins and fiat tokens and what's taking place, we're seeing the birth of arrangements that are the next generation of electronic money and digital currency and its benefits. And it's it's quite a significant advancement over those uh, earlier electronic money systems. Um, and in both of those first two cases, it's not like central banks stepped in and said, we got to run this. <laughs> we're going to run this stuff. Um, they didn't. They 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 said no. Well, what we do is we issue our money supply and we set you know safeguards and we make sure that if you are in one of these arrangements that you are properly regulated. Um, and I think that can be the same thing. And I, I think that's very you know consistent with the synthetic or hybrid CBDC you know mm-hmm. models that that are being discussed right now. And so uh, both of you are suggesting that standards here are really at the heart of interoperability. Standards, perhaps on network design, on token design and settlement, uh, standards on wallet design, uh, potentially, so that they can accept uh, multiple uh, different tokens. Um, Who should set those standards? Um, Just the private sector, a consortium of of, uh, private sector firms? Who should participate? Should the public sector be involved? How long does it take to set standards? Is it reasonable? There's a lot of skepticism among policymakers on standards, because we know how difficult it is to bring actors together and agree and reach a consensus on uh, things such as standards. Jeremy, you uh, alluded to various examples of where standards do work, but my question to both of you is, is very simple. Who should be setting these standards on network and tokens and wallets? Danelle, do you want to go first? Well, we already have standards bodies that know how to operate very well on the web. And I, and I, I think that, yeah, it takes a long time to set standards uh, in terms of making sure those standards actually work and will work across networks and will work in different ways. But it actually, it, a long time is actually uh, just a process of ensuring that that everybody can plug into those. So like web standards didn't take forever to get set up. It actually was a relatively streamlined process. And even today, when you bring something to a web standards body, it doesn't take a period of years to get through uh, sometimes if you actually can demonstrate that there's value and there's interoperability and that there's ways for everyone to plug into it. I actually think that we have uh, standards bodies that are emerging with within uh, our, our industries. And I think that those could actually leverage themselves. And I will tell you, and I will agree that there are opportunities for folks to come in and try to ram through um, standards that because they have a lot of power in the industry and we have to watch for that. Um, I think it's a multi-stakeholder process. I think it's the private industry. I think the public and the public sector could actually participate in that as well, but not by setting the standards themselves, but by listening and learning from the different uh, players that come to it. 
So I think the most important part about a standards body, if we wanted to get very specific about a body that could be set up for this, for, the, for uh, in, in terms of focusing on the financial structures, it would need to be a body that has multiple different stakeholders, has the public sector that can come in and participate on some level uh, because they know how to regulate fiat currency very well. Um, but we actually have these bodies that exist today and we would just have to expand them. Um, we, and we're already operating in that methodology today in terms of, you know, sometimes we actually go to standards bodies from the web standards groups to talk to them about how we could actually get these standards set. So I don't think it's actually that far off. Okay, thanks. Jeremy, anything to add uh, briefly? Because well, I'd like to also yeah. touch on cross-border payments if possible. Yeah, sure. I, I, I will echo what Dan, Danelle said, um, and, and I, I, I'm very passionate about it and trying to establish some of those early standards bodies like Center Consortium. And I think um, th this is ripe for multi-stakeholder engagement, ripe for you know regulators and central banks and others to participate in. And I, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, accelerating development in, in that uh, over the next year or so. Great. Uh, thanks very much. And and. What I'd like to do in the last five minutes that we have is um, take a step into the international or cross-border uh, world. So I think what we've been talking about until now, central bank digital currencies, et cetera, is a discussion focused on, on domestic use of money. But uh, cross-border is obviously very important. We make payments to foreign companies when we trade. We send money abroad when we uh, send money to uh, our uh, our kids uh, who are studying abroad or, or simply um, when we buy assets abroad. So, you know, interoperability is going to be increased, is going to be just as important, but more difficult to achieve. Uh, it's one thing when you bring in domestic actors and agree on standards. Another thing when you bring in international uh, actors to agree on standards. There's another thing, which is interoperability, it seems to me, and I'd like to hear your views on this, is goes beyond technological interoperability. So it's one thing to be able to receive a token issued by uh, on another uh, network, um, but it's another thing to be able to um, hold a claim on a money held abroad uh, issued um, when, when you hold a token um, issued by a foreign company. So to me, there's a legal aspect to interoperability as well, which may be a barrier when you move to cross-border payments. Do you see that as a problem? Um, how do you think of interoperability going beyond just technology? Jeremy or Donnell, do you have views on this? Let me just jump in quickly and say that I actually think that there are legal issues within each geography that, you know, there could be implications of remittances and taxes and, and how the uh, each region and, and how each country actually uh, represents itself with that. But in terms of interoperability, as it is today, just take the Stellar Network itself, which is one that I know well enough to be able to articulate on this, is that you could actually have a USD token, you could have Circle, and then you could take that, make that, and you want to send money to your family in Brazil, you could actually do that through the network itself. And then they could actually, uh, it, it could be, um, we have a decentralized exchange on the Stellar Network, and you could exchange that for a payment that goes and is in Brazil's local currency, so long as there's an anchor on both sides of it. And in, in our anchor, in our terminology, an anchor is a financial institution that can redeem it can be an, an on-ramp and an off-ramp for those assets. So it's actually quite simple. What you have to deal with is on the other side, making sure that you are respecting the regulatory processes of the region that you're going into or out of. And I think that we actually have processes already set up for that from making sure that you have KYC and AML, which is a lot of what's required in those geographies, in all geographies. Uh, but I don't actually think that there, the, the legal requirements are going to be for the financial institutions that are actually operating on those edges and, and getting you on and off the technology layer. The technology layer, which is the blockchain, is this foundational infrastructure that anyone can be participate in if it's a global um, open network like Stellar, that anyone can participate in and become a part of um, and permissionless, right? So you can just join the network and be part of it because it's the the documentation is set and it's easy to do. So I don't think actually the fiat to, to different fiat digital to fiat to digital digital to fiat on each side is actually really well structured within the blockchain networks themselves. Hmm. Interesting. Jeremy, anything to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, um, stable coins on public blockchains are 
it just a, an, an amazing innovation that allows digital cash to exist everywhere that the internet exists. And I think it um, is way ahead of the law. <laughs> and I don't mean that in, in a bad way. I, I just mean like, this is a, this is a breakthrough. It's a new reality that uh, you can have a, a digital asset that exists uh, even intergalactically because the internet, <laughs> you know, is in at now in outer space. But um, the, the point being, uh, that, you know, the internet doesn't think about borders. The internet thinks about just, you know, uh, IP addresses and, uh, and, and these, these digital tokens, they don't actually exist in a physical geography. They exist on a blockchain. The blockchain is replicated everywhere. And so I think a lot of the things that have to do with data, with borders, uh, and the law of the movement of money, it, it's just, it's, it was conceptualized for a very, very different uh, world. And um, so my view is we should embrace what be, what has become possible, which is that basically value in any currency can move instantly everywhere in the world at virtually no cost, uh, can be utilized in, in very powerful new ways. We should embrace that. We should embrace the, the transformative uh, potential of that for the world economy and figure out what are the risks that have to be managed or those Risks have to do with uh, a given a sovereign's ability to, say, control their economy or uh, uh, a given uh, set of constraints or concerns around the abuse of, of financial instruments by criminals. But what are those risks and how do we address those in a world where you have ubiquitous you know, digital currency that can exist you know, everywhere all at once? So um, I, I think the notion of a cross-border payment, for example, will be a anachronism. I think in five years, uh, the, the concept will be as foreign as saying, I just sent a cross-border email or I just you know browsed an international website. It's just that, that those concepts don't exist on the internet. And I think that's going to be the case with money very, very soon. Right. No, that's, that's, uh, it, sounds, it sounds wonderful. I hope that we get there. Um, I think that there may be some, some legal uh, barriers to uh, making it so simple uh, because you do hold claims against foreign institutions that are sometimes, uh, you know, difficult to uh, enforce across borders. Uh, so we have to recognize, I think, that that uh, reality. But uh, I think that vision seems very attractive. And, uh, you know, one day we may even have exchanges uh, for these tokens so that when you send me, if I'm in Japan and you're in the U.S. and uh, you want to pay me, I don't receive your dollar stablecoin, but you go on an exchange, yeah. exchange your dollar stablecoin for a yen a coin, which then you send me. But we have uh, then I today. have a claim I mean, on some sort of domestic institution. Right. We have those today. I mean, digital asset exchanges do that today, yeah. and they're going to list all these stablecoins and de decentralized exchanges like uh, what operates on Stellar and on other blockchains exist today. And, and that can be done automatically, programmatically. And so that's already here. Um, so it's really about, you know, more legitimate issued stable coins in more markets. And then I think we'll have real time liquidity across currency. That's right. And settlement that's right. for everyone. Yeah, that's right. Excellent. So I'm told that we need to wrap up. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, lots of food for thought. I would like to just ask you a very last question. Uh, what is the main message you would send to policymakers today? Very briefly, what is your main message to policymakers? Jeremy, do you so want to go I'll first? start. Oh, okay. Jeremy, no. Go ahead. Uh, 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 yes, go ahead. <laughs> I'll just say that I think I would love to engage with more policymakers all around the world. And don't be afraid of this technology. This technology is actually going to enhance uh, what you've already put into play. And there's not a whole lot of work to be done here because there's already regulation. You, you know how to regulate currency. You know how to regulate fiat. And this just plugs into that. And so don't be afraid of this. We, we want to engage. We want to explain this technology. Uh, again, this is just foundational. What you've already laid is just another thing that we can go on top of. So I think that this is a great opportunity for the globe to be able to be more connected. Yeah, I totally Thank echo you, Benel. I, I had wanted to leave you the last words, but your, your enthusiasm took over. And I think those are um, uh, very encouraging words for policymakers, not to be afraid of this technology, to look into it, to understand it, uh, and to... Um, collaborate with it, see, see how it can be guided uh, with regulation so that it becomes safe and efficient. Uh, Jeremy? I, I echo, again, a lot of what Danelle's saying. And I think, um, you know, uh, really, uh, uh, this is a time to engage. It's a time to dive in and understand this. Um, the, you know, th this, there's an incredible community of 
creative technologists, of entrepreneurs, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of them in every corner of the of the world today that are innovating in, in crypto and blockchain and, and really trying to build this new type of global economic system that is more fair, more inclusive, more efficient, and that really does connect the world, you know, more deeply economically. So it's a tremendous opportunity. And we need we need policymakers who want to help you know build the future and um and i i think it's a yeah likewise i think it's a tremendous time for engagement wonderful thank you so much i think the fact that uh, we were all together on this panel uh, you being the innovators and i the policymaker is a very good signal that uh, <laughs> we are trying to bridge this gap so thank you Absolutely. again very very much for a wonderful panel and um, enjoy the rest of the afternoon thank you